any time you build any piece of software, or create any experience, why wouldn't you voice enable it? Why wouldn't you give someone the ability to hit a microphone button and say what they would have read? My son can basically navigate the whole world through YouTube or Google search because he can just hit a microphone button and say what he wants and it's natural language. So he doesn't have to know exactly what he wants to say to add these things in. They don't hurt the development process. They don't take longer to develop. They're already built, but you have to have an intention for accessibility and add these things in. And then the good news is your funnel opens. As a marketer, you get way more people looking at your content, reading your content, coming and looking at what you have to offer, as opposed to being like, unless you can read, you can't play here. We're, we're there. There's no reason we shouldn't do it differently. Welcome to the Sound in Marketing podcast. Let's talk about the ethics of AI because from what I understand of it, it's kind of the Wild West and it's an on your honor system at this point. I know that there, there's a lot that's being established and standardized, but it's not quite there yet. What have you experienced? What do you hope will come in the future? I think I joined Microsoft because at the time Satya Nadella was preaching a very strong message um, about how important it was that we create a consortium and that we create like a partnership. And there's a website called Partnerships on AI. It's just very interesting to me that like, so he says that I'm like, that sounds great. I want to be part of it. But the reality was, is that in the inside of the organization, there were not tools that a individual or collection of developers, like a whistleblower program, right? Where you could pull the chain on something that you thought wasn't good and someone would hear you, listen to you, do something with that. Um, and I think that's the industry's challenge with ethics right now. It's multiple fold actually, because it starts with engineers not being required to take ethical training in their engineering programs, which is one thing I'm trying to fix in my education program. So there's no ethics training about what is the impact of building machine learning and data science you know, outcomes um, when it comes to like ethical and proper use of this technology. Uh, but then once that person gets into the workforce, even if they did get trained ethically, they have no tool set that they can use. There's no, you know, like labor union they can go to, to say, Hey, this is wrong. I don't feel good about this. They can raise it to their manager, which I have done. Their manager might raise it to their manager. But in some of these companies, it's like six layers deep. And the reality is, is it's a billion dollar revenue generating solution. And they're going to say, thanks for your input. We'll look into it. And then you never hear anything. And then that model goes live. And then in my case, the model, you know, gets outed as being biased and now is getting shut down. Like, and those engineers that tried to call it, they, they could have saved the company time, money, embarrassment, brand, you know, all the things but there was no mechanism inside the company to do that. So I do love though, Partnerships on AI is one of my favorite organizations. They created a set of tenants. There's a huge consortium. Amazon then uh, you know, adopted some of those and created some policies inside the organization. But I, I think it's still important for everyone who's non-technical to know that a lot of these teams are just built by people like you and me, like they care about a thing, they got a job. Like they're not thinking about the impact of what they're writing on a hundred million people. They're not doing the things they do every day thinking, wow, I am changing, you know, the life of a 72 year old man who's lonely and, you know, doesn't have interaction and is cognitively impaired or my son who's 14 and it's down. Like, I mean, and they're, they're almost all the same type of people. So those two things combined, it makes it very hard in that moment to even think about ethics. To even think about what a bad ethical implication or outcome would be, because you can only think of the good things when you're building it. You only think like, this is how it's meant to be used. And that's the huge danger with AIs. Data collected for an AI solution can be repurposed for almost anything. And we don't, you know, this is why I think people are almost rightly to be concerned about like a Skynet or a malicious intent um, AI, you know, solution because we're collecting data haphazardly without much thought or reason um, and really no professional or you know, industry training 
on the ethical implications of that collection. I mean, thank goodness for GDPR. If we didn't have GDPR, we would never have tightened up anything in the US. <laughs> so, so regulation does have its place because um, it definitely pushed the needle for organizations that weren't going to do anything, but it's not enough. You know, it's, it's just the beginning. Well, and you were saying it was like company by company is making their own ethics and regulations and stuff. And it really truly sounds like it needs to be an organization uh, dependent or independent of everyone else saying, no, this is the guidelines you need to do. Because there that's might right. be one company that's doing a great job and another company that's not. And they both think that they're doing whatever their morals are. Everyone ha the, here. Here you go. It's it's kind of like having like uh uh, having a religion and having ethics attached morals and ethics attached to this religion that you have those are your standards but somebody in another religion has a different set of morals and standards that they go by and who's to say who's right or wrong so yeah and i think that's also a big challenge is that right now we're building these very large silos right if you especially in voice you build for voice you're an alexa dev or a google dev and if you're both, it's not that you're like building one thing for both. Like you literally have to keep all the things for Alexa in your head and all the things for Google in your head. And now Bixby has come out. It's its own new silo. Siri is, you know, not, we can't build against it, but that's probably a temporary thing. So we're going to have all of these like siloed virtual assistants. They're not sharing any of their data, but they're all collecting the same type of data. And so they're each collecting their own person, you know, their own set of data, and they're not sharing it with each other, which is one of the things I hope we evolve to, that that data doesn't become what, pe what companies value. Like the data should be open and we should know as people contributing to that data that we are solving a bigger problem. We're not just feeding Amazon's, you know, Alexa dreams. And then I have to go over and, you know, like there are no lessons learned. I think of this most, mostly in healthcare right? Like hospitals have the same problem. Each hospital collects its own data. But if they actually shared their data, do you know how much more we could do, how much faster we could solve problems? But they're all like closed fist, you know, like cards close to the vest. I don't want to show you mine. You know, you don't show me yours. But we, we limit ourselves when we do that. That's why open source became a thing because we finally evolved in technology to realize we were better together than apart. And we're not there in voice, unfortunately. <laughs> so now in voice, we have to instill within, you know, within our industry, how do we make sure we realize we're better together than apart? And we're already down the path of you know, siloed data sets. So we have a lot of work to even undo in our you know, youngness of a, as an industry. That sounds mirrored to real life too. Better together than apart. You know, People that are segregating themselves and not getting... The bigger picture. I always think of it as like us as a world community, as a spider web. We all have a different strand and you can't get the full web experience unless you're all attached to each other. So it's unfortunate though, because those of us who've been around enough and seen it in other industries, we're watching ours, we're making the same exact mistakes. And because there's no consortium, you know, because there's no, no group of individuals or companies that can set a standard this early um we're just going to walk walk down the same path that we've been down before and then in 10 years we'll open source it and we'll solve new problems but it's just really sometimes very disappointing to to watch <laughs> mistakes get repeated uh, right in front of you it makes more sense to have all of this different tech speak to each other because i think as a consumer as well that would be really frustrating if you could only go with one product or one um, one company for your product because uh, you started off with, you know, an Android. So you can't get Siri devices. You know, you have to stick with Android supported things. You become an Alexa house and it's super hard to become a Google house. And that's kind of been my, my platform since I left Alexa and learned about the different ways that Amazon, Alexa, um, and Microsoft and Google and now Bixby are all doing this. I was like, man, we should build this once. And then these are just channels. And I should be able to start a conversation with Google in my car, right? On, and then be able to go, or maybe on Siri with CarPlay or whatever it is. But I should be able to start in one place, go to my work, talk to my laptop, have it. Then I come home, I talk to my kitchen. And it's all the same backend stuff. It's all the same functionality, all the same 
work. Um, I'm not building for uniquely independent data sets, uniquely independent user experiences that are different for Alexa than it is for Google. And that's what we're doing right now. I mean, there's, there's no way to scale. If somebody has a great idea, they're, there's no way for them to scale that experience across all of these platforms. Um, not easily anyway. It's very painful to have to learn each thing. Like, it doesn't make sense to me. So I'm like, one bot to build them all, you know? <laughs> you know, uh, how do we create? And Microsoft, of course, built something like that, but they're Microsoft, so they're inherently a silo. <laughs> so how do we get to a point where we create an open source you know, virtual assistant bot framework, if you will, that allows everyone to build a conversational experience. And then it's just a channel and adapter that you add. If I want it to be on Google, I add this adapter. And that way, as people go through their experience, they come back to that main application that it hosts their state and what they said last and what app they were on and what context they're in and whether they're at home or at work. But right now, we, there's no way. If I start a conversation on Google and then I go to the same app on Alexa, they don't even know that I've been there. I have to start over. Uh, and that, from a customer perspective, that doesn't make sense to me. The newness of voice. People like me, consumers like me, are trying to figure out how to use this stuff. So you've got a smart speaker that you barely know how to use, you know? <laughs> yeah, you're and using then, like 2% of its capability. <laughs> exactly. I know I am. I know yeah. I'm only using 2%. And so you use that and then you're introduced to something else and then you're forced to learn that and then you learn something else and it's, it's going to slow down the process, honestly. I think that it's going to slow down the process. Um, speaking of accessibility, Smartphones are awful for the blind um, because it's a it's a touch screen. Looking up a flip phone, they're more expensive now than a smartphone. Supply and demand. Makes, <laughs> it makes no sense. Well, I guess that's it yeah. but with the warehouses nowadays. But, um, you know, like there's, there's certain things that it's like technology is growing and excelling, but it's leaving people behind. Yeah. And... Um, I think with voice, there's a really cool opportunity because I always talk about voice is not a replacement to other advertising and marketing. It's an enhancement to it. And so with this capability of multimodal functionality, um, what kinds of things have you been seeing that have really helped further that, especially with your son? Um, what kinds of things have you been seeing? Yeah, so you're right though. Unfortunately, even with like apps in the app store uh, for iPhone or iPads, um, the same application adapted for someone like my son who's struggled, you know, he's got cognitive disabilities with Down syndrome. They're way more expensive, like to the hundreds of percent more expensive. Same thing. It's just now it speaks instead of, you know, like you have to read it and now the buttons are bigger or the colors are different. Um, and it's very interesting to me because like his constituency is not the one that can pay for that. Like actually the people paying $4.99 can pay for that. <laughs> Just add another buck and make it free. I don't know. But with voice, we are actually in a place in this industry where developers Unfortunately, for one, one side of it is the developers are somewhat limited by what they can do because of the platforms that they're building for. So Alexa creates the API, and even though we're only using 2% of it, it's not like 98% of it is then unlocked through an API, right? They've created a very small sliver of functionality that's unlocked through the API, maybe 25%, maybe less. Um, but there is an opportunity for people, us, to build experiences for Alexa. And really what my vision is just voice enabling anything. So my son, Alexa was the first, but YouTube got very good at voice search oh, since then. Um, it wasn't good when Alexa launched. It's now much better. But any time, a website, a mobile app, any time you build any piece of software, create any experience, why wouldn't you voice enable it? Why wouldn't you give someone the ability to hit a microphone button and say what they would have read, right? Like, button names, anything. Uh, you know, my son can basically navigate the whole world through YouTube or um, Google search because he can just hit a microphone button and say what he wants. And it's natural language. So he doesn't have to know exactly what he wants to say. It doesn't have to be a perfect, he doesn't have to click exactly the right click trail, right? He doesn't have to go to this button and then this menu, which is hard for him from an executive function perspective. But he can just say, hey, I want to see, you know, 
villain deaths on, you know, Disney, um, and it will pop up exactly what he wants. Or I want to find, you know, new movies on Disney Plus, and Google will show him what they are, and he can click on it, and it will take him to the app. So how do we do that for the world? Like, how do we just use voice? Because it's not just accessibility to people like my son or people with physical disabilities, but it's literally anyone who struggles to use a device. So like my dad, who's older, um, anyone who's older, eventually using a small device. I mean, I now see my peers who are like in their forties, they're getting to that point where they're like having to hold the phone away from them. <laughs> Right. My older 40s are like, what happened? Five years ago, I was fine. And now I can't see. Um, it, it, but why? Why even do that to people? Right. Why not just make everything voice accessible? But it's not just voice. I recently saw um, or I should say it's not just like Alexa. I saw Polly. Polly is AWS's version of um, speech to text or text to speech. So I saw on a blog post, there was this lot, you know, a player at the top of the blog post and it was like powered by uh, Amazon Polly. And it literally was an API that just ingested the blog and the output of that blog was an audio file that you could play. Why? It probably was five to 10 lines of code. Why wouldn't we do that for everything? And then let's say I'm ADD and I struggle to read text on a page. I saw something just today where you clicked on this little sprite icon, you click on it and it has an immersive reader. This is an API available today. Any developer can use it. And these little things, but you have to make, you have to set the intention at develop, you know, in the development to add these things in. They don't hurt the development process. They don't take longer to develop. They're already built, but you have to have an intention for accessibility and add these things in. And then the good news is your funnel opens as a marketer. You get way more people looking at your content, reading your content, coming and looking at what you have to offer, as opposed to being like, unless you can read, you can't play here. <laughs> and that, that seems just, the tech is, we're, we're there. There's no reason we shouldn't do it differently. And again, I mean, this is like putting, putting in the investment in the front end for a bigger payout. Yes. Yeah. I mean, you're just talking about how the marketers will be, you know, they'll be seen more places and um, including everyone again, gives you some more emotional connection and genuine feeling from companies and brands. I'm going to leave it at that. Noel, this has been wonderful, very enlightening. Thank you so much for your, uh, your thoughts and your perspective. Yeah, it's been really fun. Um, I just, it's so good to talk about this because that's how it all starts, right? Just with a conversation. So I'm really grateful for the questions and letting me talk about what I'm really passionate about. <laughs> You're welcome and thank you. As a fairly new community, the voice industry has a unique opportunity to avoid some or all of the mistakes that older communities have made, where cultural and societal stories have been omitted. Let's represent and unite all peoples and be a true global community. For more of the Sound and Marketing Podcast, don't forget to follow, subscribe, and share. You can find us on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, iHeartRadio, Pandora, and Stitcher. For inquiries on producing and developing your own podcast, or for inquiries on sonic branding and sonic branding consultation availabilities, you can find me at Dreamer Productions. That's D-R-E-A-M-R productions.com, LinkedIn, and Facebook. You can also email me at Gina, J-E-A-N-N-A, at dreamerproductions.com. All links will be provided in the show notes. This episode was produced by Dreamer Productions and hosted, written, and edited by me, Gina Isham. Let's make this world of sound more intriguing, more unique, and more and more on brand.